Good morning, everybody. Bright and early on a Friday morning. This is the Tilt Lawyer Podcast. I'm joined remotely by Ileana Colon Rosa. We're going to discuss the Karen Reed case. They are seating a jury as we speak. Maybe they're going to get started on Monday, but there's one of three possibilities. Either Karen Reed is responsible for the murder of John O'Keefe herself on purpose, or she murdered him on accident by backing up her car, not realizing that she ran him over, or the people in the house where they were uh, visiting for an after bar midnight affair uh, decided to murder him in cold blood and try to cover it up and pin it all on Karen. We're going to discuss what are the most likely possibilities based on the evidence going on. There is a lot going on with this case. You're going to want to stick around. It's going to be a good one. Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. We're going to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat. Feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. All right, so very briefly, uh, Karen Reed, 44 years old right now. Um, she has, there's, okay, everybody is fighting with everybody in this case. The DA is fighting with the feds, is fighting with the defense attorneys. The defense, the defense attorneys are fighting with everybody. There's this guy named Turtle Boy that's fighting with the victims that was arrested for, arrested for a witness intimidation. Uh, there is going to be high-profile uh, scientific battles over the specific evidence in this case. It is one of the most messy cases that I can remember. <clears throat> and it is one of the, well, here's my opinion. This is one of the most controversial cases because the evidence is really so polarizing. And so much is what, of what has come out so far has largely just been bullshit. A lot of people are getting it from the pleadings. The problem with getting it from the pleadings is that they're putting out arguments out there that have not been tested by evidence. And people are taking that and they're running with it. And they're saying, oh, she's definitely guilty because the Apple iPhone data says uh, whatever it says. And then people are saying, oh, that's not reliable or that's not what it said. And the FBI already investigated this and that. There's all kinds of misconceptions about how the evidence was tested. I will caution everybody into saying that... The trial is going to begin on Monday, the evidentiary portion of it. And it's only in, until that happens that we're going to actually know what the evidence is. We know what the arguments are, but I don't know. I have no idea what the experts are actually saying about this. And we're going to be talking about this for the next six to eight weeks. There's like 170 subpoenaed witnesses in this case. A little, a little bit more. Um, I will say this, that of all the years that I have been an attorney um, and have been invested into trials of this kind. The defense attorney in this case is probably the best that I've ever seen in terms of representing his clients. He has done such a good job of trying this case in the media and just getting it out there that Karen Reed didn't do this. The evidence that's been collected doesn't make sense. The autopsy photos, the injuries that John O'Keefe sustained, uh, there's no possible way that he got those injuries from being backed into with a car. It looks like he was attacked by Wolverine and implicating these third-party possible um, murderers that have not been charged, basically raising reason, reasonable doubt as to Karen Reed. And in my experience, whenever you have a case that's polarizing like this, which is a 50-50 case, most of the time you inherently have reasonable doubt. So the jury selection process is still ongoing as far as I know. I don't think that they wrapped up yesterday. They've been doing jury selection since the 16th. And they do not do court on Fridays over there. And so right now, um, I believe they have not yet seated a full jury. They have, they're probably going to get like six alternates in addition to the 12 seated juries. I think they're at 15 right now. And um, it's really important because as high profile of the case as this is, um, it's going to be difficult to find jurors that don't have an opinion one way or another about Karen Reed. 
It's going to be difficult to find people that don't know who Turtle Boy is. It's going to be difficult to pe- find people that haven't heard the arguments from the defense attorney, haven't heard the uh, evidentiary theories on both sides that aren't invested in this case um, somehow. And so the jury selection is, is kind of all over the place right now. But that's the issue that they're, that, that they're, that they're having. So this case has been going on since about 22. Um, and since that time... This case has very much been litigated in the media. True Crime Podcast, the Law and Crime Network. Ileana, yesterday I I watched this segment from the Law and Crime Network, and it was literally this law student and, like, this guy that's, like, Captain Free Karen Reed, and they were trying to, like, make their evidentiary arguments, and both of them were saying, no, you just made it up. Hey, you're making it up. Everybody's making up evidence, I guess. And it was hilarious because the the, the law student was like, you don't understand that first-degree murder is a two-pronged test, and you have to have the the requisite mens rea. And it's like, he's clearly, like, preparing for his law school final. So you need to get back in the books, buddy. You are not ready for this. He definitely watched Legally Blonde. Maybe it's what it was. <laughs> yeah, it's just a theme that the famous scene, or well, one of the uh, famous scenes that talks about mens rea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was literally breaking down his analysis as if it was a law school finals. Like, oh, I remember those days so well. Um, all right, so who was Karen Reed? Uh, she was born in 1979. She's 44 years old. Um, worked as a financial analyst um, and a college professor, an adjunct college professor at her alma mater. Um, she gained prominence due to her involvement in this case, high-profile Massachusetts murder trial. She's been charged with second-degree murder in the death of her boyfriend, Brian O'Keefe. Um, she grew up in Blacksburg, Virginia, and Taunton, Massachusetts, in a supportive environment with her parents. She doesn't have a criminal record to speak of. Um, she enjoyed playing the piano. She has a passion for music. Uh, there, there's nothing to indicate in her past that she was ever going to find herself in this position. There are some questionable voicemails that were left, um, to her boyfriend the night that he died. There's been all kinds of speculation about, Hey, John O'Keefe was a cheater um, he was living the life of a bachelor police officer in Boston and, you know, whatever. And, but there's also been indications that she was having an affair with one of the detectives that was at the house. And there's all kinds of stuff going on. And she's 44, which is kind of old to be getting into all that stuff. Um, but, you know, she's dating. I guess and maybe it's not. Uh, John O'Keefe is 46 when he passed. Um, <clears throat> she's faced health challenges uh, during the course of her life. She has Crohn's disease. She's underwent multiple surgeries. Uh, she has um, exceptional, ex, exceptional intellectual capabilities. She's a brilliant lady if you just take her at face value. Um, so you find her involved in this scenario and it's like, well, Eliana, let's go back to January 29th of 2022. So it was after, shortly after midnight, that Karen Reed and John O'Keefe and a group of friends, they went to the Waterfall Bar and Grill in Canton on the night of January 28th of 22. They were having drinks. They were having a good time. The surveillance footage shows that they were having a good time. There was nothing to indicate that anything was awry. According to prosecutors, Reed had consumed several alcoholic beverages. Reed drove O'Keefe to the home of Boston police officer Brian Albert. And that is where police said people from the bar were meeting back up. They were going to have the after party. I don't know about you, Ileana, but at 1 a.m., 12 a.m., after you've already had some drinks at the bar, how motivated are you? at your age, at my age, to uh, going to the, the, the local after party with your friends to drink more? Uh, not much, but I can tell you that my husband will definitely be excited. I guess it depends a lot on the personality. <laughs> so, yeah, I can see it happening and at that age. Well, that's what they did. Um, Court documents reveal that in the weeks before and even the hours leading up to the night out, that there were text messages going back and forth between Karen and John, as well as voicemails 
showing that they had a strained relationships. Um, investigators said that around 1 a.m. on January 29th, which is when she left uh, that place, that Reed had allegedly left O'Keefe a really nasty voicemail saying, you are an effing loser, F yourself, and John, I effing hate you, and carrying on like that. So she was mad at him for something. And this is after she sped off from that residence. It was at 4.23 a.m. while there was heavy snow falling that, falling that O'Keefe's niece called Jennifer McCabe, who was a key player in all of this, Brian Albert's sister-in-law and a friend of O'Keefe's. And she said that Reed was distraught because O'Keefe had not come home and was not answering his cell phone. And according to court documents, McCabe said that she heard Reed screaming, John didn't come home. We had a fight. Around 5 a.m., Reed called another woman whose husband was friends with O'Keefe. Prosecutors alleged that Reed said while they searched, what if he's dead? What if a plow hit him? I don't remember anything from last night. We drank so much. I don't remember anything. So there's a lot going on. Let's take a deeper examination into this timeline because it's, it's crucial. So this is what the prosecution has laid out in court documents. Around 737, January 28th, O'Keefe is seen on surveillance arriving at C.F. McCarthy's house in Canton house. C.F. McCarthy's in, Can in Canton. At 8.51, Reed is seen on the video arriving at the same place. At 8.58, there was a bartender, hands Reed a glass containing some clear liquid with a lime in it, probably some like kind of vodka soda concoction. Um, that all women drink, by the way. What is it with, like, vodka and soda? Like, why is that such the popular drink? I don't get it. Are you a vodka and soda person, Ileana? Not with soda. I like vodka with orange juice or grapefruit juice. Um, but, yeah, I will prefer But vodka. you're a vodka and something person, I, I gather. Yeah, definitely over any whiskey. <laughs> so she gets started at 8.58. She has her first drink. At 9.15, bartender hands her another glass. At 9.20, bartender hands her another glass for three drinks in. At 9.33, bartender hands her another glass for four drinks in within a span of 40 minutes. At 9.57, bartender hands Reed another glass and a shot glass with clear liquid in it. Tequila, maybe. Um, at 10.22, bartender hands, hands Reed another glass for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven drinks in. And at 1040, video shows Reed and O'Keefe leaving the bar. Reed is seen holding her latest drink in her right hand as they exit. And at 1054, O'Keefe and Reed are seen on video arriving at the Waterfall Bar and Grill in Canton together. All right, so definitely if I'm eight drinks in ever, I'm not going anywhere else. I think that I'm fine exactly where I'm at. I have no desire to go... I don't know, man. I don't, I don't, I've never understood the bar hopping thing. Have you, are you a bar hopper? You and your husband? Um, every now and then we do it when we were younger. That was definitely a thing for us. Um, I guess I have grown out of it a little bit, but my husband hasn't. So yeah, I mean, like for example, Temecula, like, downtown Temecula that's a good area to go bar hopping um I just the wine country I, like the wine all those restaurants no no downtown oh Temecula, they have a lot of bars and you can go like bar hopping but yeah, yeah. I mean I at eight drinks I don't think I can hold that. I don't I, I don't understand the psychology <laughs> I, look it's like if I'm if I'm going to a place and I'm going to bar to drink I'm going to be here we're going to drink I don't need to go to another place to do the exact same thing. We're already here. Who needs the aggravation? I don't get it. I don't get it. Even in my, even when I was in my twenties, I was not a bar hopper. Like, what are we hopping for? Like, we're already here. We just order another drink. There's a pool table. There's what? Never mind. I don't know. I guess it's changing scenes. Like at least back in Puerto Rico, there's that thing called chinchorreo, which is. You go bar hopping, but it's like really small bars and you just go have a drink and then you change mm. because you want to see who else is in that other bar, what other drinks they have. And mm. I don't know, I guess you get bored <laughs> at one place and want to 
find something new to do. I don't know. But, maybe that's like the old TikTok scrolling. Like that's what it used to look like in like the nineties. Hey, let's see what this bar is like and who's in here and nah. So later that morning, after midnight, Reed exits the establishment with two women through the front door. O'Keefe exists or exits moments later after taking a sip from his glass and carrying the drink out in his right hand. At 12.11, video shows O'Keefe carrying the glass, meeting up with Reed. The two walk together toward Washington Street. At at 12.14, O'Keefe sends a text asking a friend where to. He receives a text with an address on Fairview Road from the sister of the homeowner. At 12.15, a video consistent with Reed's SUV is seen on video traveling past the Canton Town Library. At 12.17, there's a large black SUV. It's seen on video traveling past Temple, Beth, Abraham, toward the intersection of Washington and Denham Streets. At 12.18, O'Keefe calls to ask for more specific directions. And at 12.31, the homeowner's sister sends O'Keefe a text messenger saying hello. At 12.40, she sends another message saying Pull up behind me, referencing her vehicle in the driveway. She said that she subsequently watched the black SUV move from its initial place where it had stopped near the driveway to the far left side of the property near a flagpole and fire hydrant where the body was subsequently found. Take a moment to consider our show sponsor, Aura Internet Security. If you have been following my Instagram or my Facebook, you would know that we have been attacked by hackers and the both of those accounts have been deleted, ripped off of the face of the earth. It happens. Hacking is a real thing that occurs. And let me tell you something else. Uh, data brokers will sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. And you might not believe it, but your full name, your email address, your home address, your health records, your relatives, your children, your spouse, all of it is out there. I am a lawyer. I do my own background checks. I pay good money for my background checks, but it's starting to get to the point where you could Google anybody's name and some kind of a secondary source of information, such as a birthday or email address or something. And you will find that you can Google all of this information. It's just out there for people to exploit. That's why um, I have decided to use Aura, the sponsor of today's video on Aura shows me, they show me specifically which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. And I'll tell you what, I had them when I signed up for their services, they showed me there was three separate internet brokers that were selling my information that they automatically got rid of for me by taking the initiative to opt out of those uh, memberships. So cleaning up my information, cleaning up your information, and it only reduces the amount of spam that I get. It protects me from hackers that could use my information to help them access my social media accounts. Highlight, if you've been a follower of my Instagram or my TikTok, or well, not my TikTok, but my Facebook, you will know that that account, those accounts no longer exist. They had nothing to do with anything. I had a a 20-year-old Facebook account. It's completely gone because of hackers, spammers, whatever you want to call it, it's gone. So it protects me from that. It protects your social media accounts, your bank accounts, other sensitive information. Also, Aura does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. I get other features like uh, antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set it up. I did it, matter of fact, this morning. Um, It took me about a couple of minutes to get me all set up and protected. Um, And you get it all at a really easy, affordable price. Um, But beside that, you might already have some of these tools already, but just but not but not having aura is like is literally like leaving locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. People just walk right in and take all of your stuff. I value my privacy. I value yours. You can go right now to aura.com slash tilted lawyer um, to start your two week free trial. No cost to you. It's gonna be linked below to in the description. Go in and sign up for your free 14 day trial and experience all of the protection that comes with Aura Internet Security. It's powered by inter- artificial intelligence. You're not going to regret it. Go on, go on in and check them out. At 1245, 
she sends another message, hello, and then observed the black SUV drive away. So between 1.30 and 2 a.m., there was another guest at the Fairview Road home, gets a ride home and indicated that she thought she saw something. She described a dark object in the snow by the flagpole, could not determine what it was. 4.53 a.m., the sister of the Fairview Road homeowner receives a call from Reed, who was looking for O'Keefe. And this is after she left him that really angry voicemail and instructed O'Keefe's niece to place the call. She tells Reed that she last saw O'Keefe at the Waterfall Bar and saw them leave together. At 5 a.m., Reed calls a second friend stating that O'Keefe did not come home and she was worried. According to the prosecution, Reed also told her, I, w I wonder if he's dead. It's snowing. He got hit by a plow. At 5.11, library surveillance video captures a large black SUV turning onto Washington Street towards the waterfall. And at 5.15, the same camera picks up um, the, the SUV traveling in the opposite direction towards Temple. At 5.18, a camera at the Temple captures the SUV passing. So now we're at 5.30. Reed and the friend arrive at the home of the sister of the Fairview Road resident, where she is described as hysterical. One of the women drove Reed back to O'Keefe's house while the other followed in her own vehicle. During that drive, she told investigators that Reed said, could I have hit him? Asking legitimately, did I hit him? And told her about a cracked taillight on the black SUV. That cracked taillight, I feel like, is going to be everything in this case. So... I haven't seen all of the surveillance and it hasn't been released. I mean, we're, we're going to do a full trial. But there seems to be, from what's out there, evidence of her car, whether or not her car had a cracked taillight before the events that we're talking about right now versus after is going to be very telling. Um, but that's the issue. And the fact that she's asking that question, did I hit him? She clearly hit something. There, there is indication from her defense team that she's backing out of a residence and appears to hit a parked car that was there. That would have been the source of their claiming the cracked taillight. And what they're arguing essentially is there's no effing way that you can back into somebody and hit the soft flesh of a human being and expect it to crack the taillight, to which I would argue that's nonsense. Because if you've ever seen a car run into like an animal or a deer, uh, it does a lot of damage to a car, like a lot of damage to a car. I was once driving through an unlit street when I first started driving, I literally ran over a dog. I mean, it was already dead. It was already, um, it was clearly already deceased, but I ran over it and like it put like a dent in my car and like it was damaged and there was, I don't remember if there, there was anything cracked, but if it could make that kind of damage, I don't see why it couldn't crack a taillight. It's not that hard to do. Um, so that argument, they're going to make that argument, but what's important is when was that taillight cracked? Was it cracked before the events of January 28th. And if it wasn't, if you have it on surveillance that the camera, uh, that the taillight was clearly not cracked prior to midnight around that time, and then at her house, it was a crack. It's really important that we figure out, did she run into something when she left earlier that morning, around 4.35 a.m.? And remember, she's like eight or nine, 10 drinks in at that point. So she was properly wasted. I mean, nine drinks, if you're talking about just regular run-of-the-mill vodka tequila, you're talking about 40% alcohol, um, that is going to put me on my ass. I weigh about 215. Dominic, how much you weigh? 245. I reckon that that would put Dominic at about 0 0.22, which is three times the legal limit. Just in my, in my experience, having done DUI cases before, that's usually what it is. Um, and point two two, you're like, uh, well, you were sufficiently drunk. Anything over point three, then and you're risking, you know, severe medical issues. So there's no possible way that if she was consuming those beverages at midnight, 
leaving these drunken, angry text messages to her boyfriend at like 12, 31 a.m., uh, that three hours later, she's going to be sober enough to have her wits about her. She's literally asking the question, did I hit him? Did I do any of this? Um, she, do we I, know how much she weighs? Um, I don't know what her official weight is, but she appears to weigh probably 125, 130. Oh, yeah. I mean, nine, eight, nine drinks. She's not going to remember anything. <laughs> eight or nine drinks would put I'm I'm. That, that would put I'm, me to bed. I'm amazed that she was awake. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But also that kind of alcohol consumption, you're not waking up three hours later. And if you are, well, I guess maybe you are because the hydration is it's possible. So. I don't know. I would have been next day not being able to wake up. And if I do wake up, it's like probably throwing up everywhere. So definitely not <laughs> in the position to be looking for somebody or making calls or anything like that but well last she... time i was drunk like that would have probably been 1999 new wow. year's for uh 2000 the the new millennium i remember waking up next to a toilet uh. um at some random house party that i was at at 19 years old oh. 20 years old however old i was i was doing stuff that was illegal for sure um Let's continue with this. So she's hysterical. She's asking the question, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? Um, at O'Keefe's house, Reed showed the other woman the cracked taillight. All three women then get into the same car and went to look for O'Keefe. The friend who was driving said it was snowing heavily with poor visibility. And when they arrived... Uh, but she know that Reed immediately said she saw the victim when the other women could not see it lying in the snow. So that's an important point. The prosecution is going to say, well, that was because she knew exactly what happened. And she's trying to cover it up. Um, the defense is saying that, well, there wasn't that much snowfall that night, maybe an inch or two, but it wasn't enough to completely obscure the body, um, which is true. Um, at 6.04 a.m., there was a 911 call from a woman reporting a man later identified as O'Keefe. He was found in the snow. The first Canton police officer to arrive saw three women waving at him from the front yard near a flagpole and a fire hydrant. Two of the women were performing CPR on the victim. The officer observed that the victim was cold to the touch and was not breathing. Footage from a camera attached to the officer's cruiser shows dark blizzard conditions a canton firefighter who responded to the 911 call said she witnessed reed telling her friend repeatedly i hit him i hit him i hit him um and o'keefe is officially pronounced dead now officers took that as a confession the i hit him thing uh, among other things that she said my take on that is this is a woman who is hysterical to think she may she's trying to put together circumstantial evidence in her head why do i have a cracked taillight um I don't know. What do you take of her saying that? She's hysterical, asking the question, did I hit him? And then all of a sudden afterwards, oh, I definitely hit him. And she keeps repeating it over and over again. How do you interpret that as a defense attorney? Well, I forget. You can't be the defense anymore. You have to be the prosecutor. All right. How do you interpret that as the prosecutor? I'm going to tell you how I interpret it as a defense attorney. No, I mean... Definitely, if I'm the prosecutor, I'm going to uh, say that that's uh, a confession and that she was realizing at the moment what she had done, but I can see your, what you're going to argue because it also Because it's sense. obvious, <laughs> right? Because reason, cause what this is, is a hysterical woman who just discovered the deceased body of her boyfriend, whatever you want to say about the relationship. That's a shocking thing to discover that somebody you were just out there partying with is now deceased. You have no idea what happened. You see that you have a cracked taillight and you're asking the question to these other people, did I hit him? And then you're trying to connect the dots as you're probably still inebriated. And she's just basically projecting uh, the chaos that is going on in her brain at that moment. That is not a reliable confession. Without that something more. She probably still had alcohol in her system at that time, considering that she was drinking around what 12 30, 1 a.m. That, yeah. that many drinks. So if she was, let's just say that she was 0.25. Alcohol degradation mm -hmm. is very specific and linear. 
Um, she was probably at that point still probably 0 0.15, 0 0.14, which is not falling down drunk, but it's sufficiently buzzed. And so if you're emotionally distraught and uh, your, your brain is in chaos mode because you, you can't connect these dots, um, yeah, I, I can understand that reaction. At 7.50, they pronounce O'Keefe officially dead. At 9.08 a.m., Reed's blood is drawn at Good Samaritan Medical Center. A forensic toxicologist said it revealed her BAC was 0.07 at 9.08 a.m. So then maybe then at 6.04, she was, yeah, that's about right, 0 0.14, 0 0.13 maybe, 0.12. Um, and opined that the amount around the time of 12.45, her blood alcohol would have been between 0.13 and 0.29, which is basically saying, ah, I'm just going to say everything. It's, it's all of the numbers. It could have been any of them. Um, but yeah, 0.29, anything higher than that, you're risking brain death. Um, but yeah, 0.25 is what I would guess. At 4.30 that day, Massachusetts State Police troopers arrive at the home of Reed's parents and observe her black Lexus parked outside the garage with a shattered taillight. Shattered. So she's taken into custody uh, by the Canton Police Department. Uh, the two pieces of red plastic taillight and one piece of clear plastic taillight are found by uh, Massachusetts State Police Special Emergency Response Team, uh, members who dug through the snow, and prosecutors said the plastic was consistent with broken pieces of Reed's SUV. I don't see how the defense gets around remnants of the shattered taillight being at the scene of the death. Mm -hmm. What do you say about that? That's a hard one. I mean, definitely she hit something then <laughs> yeah. at that location. So the charge is second degree murder. Um, they're not going for first degree. Nobody's accusing her of planning yeah. all of this. It's um. She kind of just gave the, the 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 prosecution her theory of the case. Did I hit him? I definitely hit him. Did I hit him? I definitely. Hit him. I, mean, I don't know. But she was point two five at the time, and she just doesn't remember. I don't know. You were going to say something, Eliana, before I cut you off. Oh no, that. What I'm trying to figure out because I I don't remember reading this about it um, is the prosecution's position that. He died because of the being hit by the car or that he died from being outside, like from the cold after being hit by the yeah. car. So the manner of death was uh, blunt trauma, blunt force injuries, in addition to hypothermia. He likely just died of hypothermia, hypothermia and exposure to the elements. And so it was a slow death. It wasn't an immediate, you know, he was laying there and he died of essentially that just exposure to the elements. Which, if you are the defense, if he died from the elements and not directly as a direct result of the blunt, tra the, the blunt force trauma, that does not support a third-party culprit. That supports this lady accidentally ran over her boyfriend, didn't know what she did, and he was laying there too injured to move or get up, and nobody noticed that he was gone, and he just died from exposure to the elements. That's going to be really important in this case. So if you break down all of the noise that's going in on in the trial, oh, she was having an affair with that guy's friend, with the federal agent. Uh, he was having an affair, an affair and they had this strained relationship. And um, these three people in the house took him inside the house and took him up and down the flight of stairs and beat the crap out of him, had his dog attack him. And they left him there for dead and trying to cover it up and make, make it look like Karen did it. And it was this entire police cover-up, which is essentially what they're trying to argue. That doesn't make a lot of sense if he's not already dead when he's laying in the snow. So, however, the autopsy evidence comes out, because the way that I've seen it happen, it have, the way that I've seen it come out so far, which is unsubstantiated until it actually gets into the trial, is it appears that he died from his injuries and because of exposure to the elements hypothermia. And if I'm the prosecution... This is the argument I should be letting you make. But if you're the pros if, if if I'm the prosecution, the fact that he died from the elements is exhibit A, B, and C as to why Karen Reed is responsible. Because she didn't know what he did. Nobody in the house knew that he was even gone. 
Nobody's in there trying to to uh, to uh, harm him. There's no evidence to suggest that there was anything amiss with any of them that would cause what you know a fight leading to a death. Um, the, it only points to an accident, which is what Karen Reed did. She negligently ran over her boyfriend and left in a fit of rage and called him on the phone and started cursing him out. And uh, that's the end of the story. The simplest, the simplest explanation, Occam's razor. How do you counter that as the defense? I know I'm not supposed to put you in that role, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, the thing is that I believe that's what, what happened, that she was so intoxicated. She doesn't remember what she did. She hit him accidentally. And yeah. I, I think that's definitely, I mean, at least from what I've seen, that to me is the most plausible way that he died considering all of the evidence now the whole wolverine wounds i don't know about that i don't have a lot of knowledge they do seem weird to me yeah but the wolverine no, wounds. <laughs> oh no i guess a trial yeah. if it's possible to get that type of injury from you're gonna have being... to make that argument yeah um is that an injury from a dog i've seen people that are 100 percent convinced <laughs> It's obvious that it's a, a, an injury from a dog, and I've heard other people argue the other way, and I'm not a dog expert. So, but my, my take on it is, is it doesn't really matter because the autopsy that was conducted by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, if it comes out like this, and from the, the indications are that the doctor's opinion is that the extensive injuries, his extensive injuries to his head likely rendered Mr. O'Keefe incapacitated and the doctor further opined that upon viewing Mr. O'Keefe's injuries and her examination of the body, she observed no signs of Mr. O'Keefe being involved in any type of physical altercation or a fight, which is questionable because if you've seen the pictures of the autopsy, I'm not so sure about that. I don't know if this lady's ever been in a fight or seen people that have been in fights, but I've heard people from the, the witnesses saying that his eyes were swollen shut. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen those pictures, admittedly, but just the scratches, the Wolverine scratches. I mean, that could have been just like him, him getting knocked into like a, a bush or something. I don't know if there was bushes that yeah, would cause those scratches. Those, that's, I think the only picture that I saw referencing like the possible dog attack, and I can tell you I've seen a lot of dog attacks. Um, yeah. And they definitely do not look like that. Like those look like scratches. Yeah. When you see a dog bite, you can see the teeth, like, like several teeth uh, punctures. And I didn't see that at least in that one picture that I saw. I don't know if there's others that show what could have been a, a dog bite. But so literally, I feel like the most important evidence right now in the case, amidst all of the chaos and the noise, which. I submit that the defense attorney for Karen Reed is probably one of the best I've ever seen. I really like that guy. He, he's he's um, a tremendous attorney. And what he's doing is he's putting out all of these smoke signals and just whoosh, look at all of this. When in reality, you got to focus on this. You got to focus on this. And he's throwing all of this other stuff out there which is the, the job of the defense. Yeah, just confuse the F out of everybody. When you have a, even as lawyers, and you could attest to this, Ileana, in, in court, when you know you got a losing argument, what's the move? Confuse the shit out of everybody. The judge, uh, opposing counsel, Your Honor, it can possibly be this because you haven't considered this case or this case and this, and I'd be really happy to brief it for you, but what they're saying doesn't make any sense. You just throw a bunch of stuff out there. It may or may not make sense. We need to have, we, we need, we're going to need to continue this for 60 days because we need to get to the bottom of this. This is nonsense. I'm completely outraged. And you create this chaos and then it extends the litigation and you get yourself out of a bad spot. Right now, that's kind of what defense is doing. The, the most important evidence is if those taillight shards are in the snow belonging to her car, and if the autopsy confirms and the scientific evidence comes out, and I don't know if it's going to confirm it or not, but if it comes out that he died from the elements and he wasn't already dead, it's a bit of a reach to suggest that anybody other than Karen Reed was the culprit. Yeah. Be because you have, I mean, it, it really is a circumstantial case because you don't have the direct evidence, but 
you know, and of course the the defense, their only defense that well, it's, all of that is there is because it was a, it was a department wide cover up. They in the house got in an argument. There was some kind of an altercation. And what the defense attorney has already just come out and said is, I don't have to prove the prosecution's case. They have to prove that it didn't happen beyond a reasonable doubt, which is absolutely right. So they could literally just throw out any theory, and unless it can be disproven through the evidence, which is true, reasonable doubt. Yeah. So they're saying, I don't know what happened. It was, it was some kind of an argument. There was some kind of infidelity. There was some kind of trust issues. Uh, there was a heat of the moment situation. A fight broke out. And um, the guy was dead, and they tried to make it look like Karen did it. So once that happened, they maybe they broke her tail light, or somebody went to her house and broke her tail. I don't know what they're going to say, which is nonsense. They're not going to say that because it's it's a ridiculous argument. But they're going to say something to that effect, and they've already said uh, quite a bit of stuff, and that's really going to be their defense. So on February first, uh, members of the Massachusetts State Police Crime Scene Services Section examined Reed's SUV and conducted tests, including a confirmation that the car's backup camera was functioning and alerted the technicians when it was approaching a dummy. A forensic scientist also found human hair on the rear of the vehicle. Troopers reviewed surveillance footage from CF uh, McCarthy's and Waterfall Bar and Grill. And on February 2nd and 3rd of 22, uh, troopers obtained a surveillance video from various Canton institutions along the routes traversed by individuals involved in the case. Um, and then they started interviewing O'Keefe's uh, niece and nephews. And, you know, here we are in this litigation. So I feel I already know what your answer is going to be. Um, what do you make of all of this, Ileana, with Miss Reed? What do you mean? like? Well, let's just talk about this. So here's, here's what the defense is suggesting. Mm-hmm. The defense suggests evidence may have been planted by another officer days later due to snow coverage. Prosecution argues that Karen Reed's vehicle damage aligns with the evidence found, implicating her involvement. And that, that's kind of where they're going with it. Let's, let's dive into this because this is actually the subject of a, um, of a defense motion. All right, so basically the defense is arguing that the evidence may have been planted. Prosecution is saying that the vehicle damage is aligned with uh, everything that they found. Um, All right. So I guess corroborating all of that, you're going to have... What do you think about the feds getting involved in this investigation, though? They don't just get involved for no reason so the very fact that they're even involved suggests that there might be some weight to this Mm -hmm. theory of a cover-up a department-wide cover-up because if this was just any run-of-the-mill murder case i mean think about it how many murder cases are you aware of where the feds got involved for a parallel investigation regarding anything surrounding the case when it wasn't already in federal court and uh, when you know specifically to clear up uh, the the veracity or lack thereof of the perceived evidence in a case. How does that strike you? They must have have some sort of evidence that they think there's something going on. Uh, I mean, there's something going on, and they need, of course, to uh, rule it out. Or I don't know. I well, know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, as, I mean, it's one thing. I mean, you hear people say this all the time. In the OJ case, they said, oh, this was a, a department-wide cover-up. They try to plant evidence um, every time there is somebody accused of a heinous crime in which there's devastating evidence that points to your guilt. The main defense is, oh, it was planted. Everybody's against me. It's the universe. But <laughs> if you have the feds getting involved trying to get more information, that is a sign that maybe it's not bullshit. Mm-hmm. Because think about it. You take it on his face. If we go with the Occam's razor argument, which is, you know, the simplest explanation. Uh, well, there's shattered remnants of her uh, taillight in the snow where the guy died. Obviously, she ran over his car. He died from the elements. Okay. But then you take into account all these other things. Um, so let's talk about his wounds. So, there is a belief that the injuries came from Brian Albert's dog, Chloe. But there's no dog DNA found on the wounds. 
Uh, there's speculation about the abrasions on O'Keefe's arms. We talked about those look like Wolverine marks. Uh, they may not be dog related, uh, leading to further investigations. Uh, John O'Keefe's injuries initially believed to be the cause um, of that dog. There's no DNA evidence. And I don't know how the how extensively the DNA evidence was tested. But indeed, if they're claiming that it was a dog and you don't find dog DNA, then really what you have is just a, a large waste of time because there's no dog that clamps on to anything like that that's not going to leave remnants of DNA, especially if there wasn't really any tampering with the body uh, shortly thereafter. Um, the defense attorneys in Karen Reed's trial are going to argue that they were caused, his injuries were caused by a beating and they're emphasizing in their pleadings uh, the wounds on his arms um, as evidence of a struggle inside the home. I don't know. I don't know. It's a stretch. But let's talk about Jennifer McCabe because that is a lot more interesting. So McCabe's actions and her statements were wildly inconsistent afterwards. So she had made a couple of search queries about O'Keefe, a search query about dying in the cold. Um, let me see if we can find that. She basically searched how long to die in cold, and she misspelled, she misspelled the word how, H-O-S, long to die in cold. She suggests um, that was at the behest of um, Karen. Okay, so these were her, this was her search. Um, Haas long to die in cold or how long to die in cold. It was unequivocally searched from McCabe's cell phone at her around 2.27 a.m. So if you buy into the Karen Reed timeline that she was not aware of O'Keefe's disappearance uh, between the hours of 12.30 and 4 a.m., she's still wondering where he's at. McCabe is over here searching at 2.27 a.m. Um, how long to die in cold. Um, what does that lead you to believe? Well, from what I've read, there's apparently a, um, a different arguments about when those texts happen yeah. or when those first happen. They Some are. people are claiming before they found the body, others afterwards. Um, but I mean... I don't know. Connecting it to what happened, of course, it looks suspicious. But at the same time, I can see how being a snow day, you can just randomly search for a fact like that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that there's anything random about that at all. How long to die in the cold? And it was searched a couple of times. And then there was an indication well, that yeah, she tried to uh, delete one of the messages. And then she says, well, Karen said, said that incriminating search was made from Jen McCabe's phone nearly two and a half hours before she'd ever received a phone call from a word, a, a worried Karen Reed looking for Officer O'Keefe. And before Reed ever even knew O'Keefe was missing, that incriminating search and Jen McCabe's subsequent bogus claim that the first thing Karen Reed asked her to do upon finding Officer O'Keefe's beaten, dying body was to Google how long does it take to die from hypothermia or something to that effect are irrefutable evidence of witness Jennifer McCabe's intentional efforts to cover for her own incriminating actions. That's what she's saying. She's saying that so Karen is the one that made her search for that. She tried to delete it afterwards, you also mentioned? Yeah. I don't remember if it was that specific search or some other one, but there was an indication that she had searched for that and she tried to delete it, and then there were subsequent searches that were not deleted. Then she, they asked, upon asking her, why did you search for that? Well, Karen told me to search for it, which is unlikely given the fact that she's an intelligent lady who owns a cell phone, um, who, I, I don't know, the first thing that Karen said that she tried to do was perform CPR and all of those things. But if you're in an emergency situation and you're tending to somebody who may or may not be dying, I don't see it reasonable to suggest that you were shouting out um, Google searches for other people to make. Especially well, if you're in the process of trying to save somebody's life. I could see somebody saying, you know, maybe Googling uh, how to do CPR or, you know, whatever, something to that effect. But how long to die in cold? I don't know. It's just strange. It is strange. 
the I think the part that kind of makes me go like, uh, it's the part that they try to delete one of the searches, but just searching for that information by itself, I don't think, I don't know. It, on one hand, I can see where we, when you find a body and you're trying to do CPR and there's other people around, you don't necessarily do things that are reasonable and you could have asked for that information. And also if this search happened before the body was found, um, which is the other uh, position or argument, I mean, I don't see it completely, I don't know. Because I, I think about all the random things that I Google, <laughs> and if I were in a similar situation, just somebody saying I'm guilty just because of that, I mean... Well, it's not just I because run... of that. Well, let's, let's, let's put some more context behind it. Okay. Yeah. So, Nicole and Brian, Albert, um, the host of the party, claimed ignorance about the emergency unfolding on their front lawn. Uh, despite being in close proximity to the incident, they chose to distance themselves and not assist. So mm -hmm. on the night in question, Brown O'Keefe, again, brutally beaten and frozen, according to, you know, what they found. On the lawn of Brian and Nicole Albert's home, um, they, despite the fact that he was lying there unconscious, clearly in need of medical assistance on their property, Brian and Nicole, who were at the home at the time, chose not to go outside or call for help. And the defense is saying that this kind of shows that they intentionally distanced themselves and didn't assist uh, the victim despite being in close proximity to the emergency situation because they were, you know, maybe perhaps responsible or knew who was responsible. Brian was also allegedly involved in assaulting O'Keefe earlier that night, breaking his nose during a fight. He and a federal agent then allegedly dumped O'Keefe's unconscious body on his own front lawn further exacerbating the emergency medical situation and showing Albert's unwillingness to help or take responsibility. That's what the defense is trying to say. Whether or not that actually happened or not, I don't know. But that's the defense's argument. That's what they're, that's, that's how they're basically trying to play this. So inside the bar, let's just paint the picture. Inside the bar, O'Keefe, they spot their friends. They're sitting in a high top over the band and he and Reed walk over, join them. Um, at the table sat O'Keefe's neighbor, Chris Albert, um, his brother, Brian Albert, who was also a BPD officer who leads the Fugitive Apprehension Team who was featured on an episode of uh, Boston's Finest, and Brian's sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe. All of them had been raised in Canton, a middle-class town of some 24,000 people. So the questions with Jennifer McCabe's uh, digital activity, uh, so the defense in Karen Reed's trial is questioning witness phone records and the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts allowed limited access to them for Karen Reed's attorneys. There's a federal probe and the federal probe revealed findings in court related to Karen Reed's defense. Um, the ex exact details are not mentioned. Um, there's a Reddit post that refers to the defense claiming that Jennifer McCabe had deleted a suspicious search from her phone's history, um, but, perf but performed an identical search later, which is kind of, I think the problem that we're having in this case is that there's so much like false information out there there's there's like a lot of accusations being thrown around and that's why it's like it's difficult to identify like what's real and what's not so we've heard stories about these deleted the deleted searches but the prosecution is stating that you know the data re extracted from a case phone it's inaccurate um forensic data and an Forensic data analyst discovered that McCabe deleted a search from her phone's history. And on Twitter, an unrelated post discusses what would be considered a suspicious Google search after finding a dead body. Um, in another case, um, there's a Google search and Apple Watch data uh, that may uh, be disruptive to the case. Uh, there's just a lot of, of weird stuff going on with McCabe's cell phone data. Eliana, are you f familiar with this guy, Turtle Boy? I... Is that the influencer or something like that? It has like a He's like this guy that just got involved um with this case. He's like one of these people that just got really invested doing his own research and he has a lot of followers. Um, but he's been threatening um well, he was arrested 
on multiple charges of witness intimidation and assault uh, for a lot of this stuff. And he has been trying to uh, basic, well, not trying to, he's made himself like a substantial part of the case, throwing out these like weird conspiracy theories, um, intimidating witnesses. Uh, his real name is Aiden Kearney. Um, he's the blogger behind Turtle Boy News. Um, and he's facing multiple charges. Uh, the charges include witness intimidation, assault and battery, conspiracy to intimidate witnesses. And prosecutors are alleging that Kearney had communicated extensively with Karen Reed and encouraged his followers, uh, referred to as minions, to intimidate witnesses in the case online and through phone calls. He has pled not guilty to the charges. Um, and he has just, you know, he's doing that kind of a thing. But I don't know. This case is bizarre. Right? So there's people that, like, want to free Karen Reed. Turtle Boy is, like, at the, at the center of them. And then there's this entirely other side that believes that Karen Reed is guilty. Um, but here's, here's my opinion on the case. There's a lot of stuff going on. But here's where I stand. I don't know how the evidence is going to come out. This federal investigation that's going on, if it has indeed covered evidence of a cover-up, which is entirely suspicious. If you have a murder investigation and the feds are getting involved, I find it problematic for the prosecution uh, to validate their evidence if there is going to be evidence submitted by the defense to suggest that it was tampered with. And this time, it's not even a theory. It's not even really so much a theory. It's something that has been brought about or legitimized by a subsequent investigation. I don't know that anything has come of that. I don't know if there's any separate charges. I know that they got this turtle, bot, uh, turtle boy guy for doing stuff, but he's not really part of the case. I just know that if all you're trying to do is find reasonable doubt in the case, then you're going to have an easy time of it if you're allowed to present any evidence whatsoever that has been corroborated in a federal investigation suggesting that there was a cover-up. Even if you have all of this stuff, let's just say you got the broken taillight remnants all there, and they're in the snow. They found them. They got her car. They have her statements at, at, the, at the place. They have her on surveillance. They have her as definitely being um, intoxicated. Um, they're going to try to say that, oh, she didn't know that she had ran him over and all of these things. If you have all of these things and the defense is able, well, what am I trying to say? I'm losing my train of thought. Ileana, help me. Well, I don't know. I don't help you because I don't know you're throwing us. Oh. You kind of lost me in there. Too. I know. I lost myself. They have all of these things, but yes. I'll, here's what I'm trying to say. If the defense cannot produce evidence that somebody else was involved, meaning any of the people, if they got the cell phone, they got this deleted search, how long does it take somebody to die in the elements? That's not really significant to me. You have these injuries. You have a lot of injuries. I have to imagine there's going to be a lot of DNA evidence. Um, there's been suggestions that he was beaten up in the house and attacked by a dog. They don't have any dog DNA that I know of. As far as I'm aware, they don't have any other DNA um, on O'Keefe that would have belonged to any of the other people inside the house. And even if they did, they're all hanging out and drinking together, you know? So what specifically were the injuries that he would have sustained in the house that would have been specific to him that was inconsistent with him being ran over? Because at this point, I don't know. What position would he have been in when he was hit by the car is problematic. You're getting hit by a taillight. He would have had to be have been bending over somehow. If he was smashed in the face with a taillight, say he like cracked his skull. I mean that's consistent, I guess, with being hit by a car. Um, but if he's got like swollen eyes and he's got these Wolverine marks or and all this other stuff, where does that even come from? That is a strange case. <laughs> yeah, I guess my point is. If the defense can't produce any evidence or give any other reasonable explanation, if they're really going to run with the story that the people inside the house murdered him and left him for dead and try to um, set Karen Reed up for the murder by planting evidence like days later after the fact, um, I think that the defense probably has a winning case. Whether or not you think that, no, look, the most simplest explanation is going to be that Karen Reed is responsible. Second degree murder. She negligently uh, punched it in her car. Uh, sped off and just took off and didn't know what she did and she was trying to remember after the fact and you know now trying to cover her ass maybe she knew more than she let on um but the 
reactions from everybody else inside of the car? I don't know. Was any of them um, interviewed and photographed as far as evidence of potential injuries to themselves, looking as if they got in a fight? Uh, because that's what they're saying. Somebody in the house took down this police officer is more than one. I don't imagine if it was a fight, the guy would have just, you know, just laid over and died. I'd imagine some kind of injuries would have been had by the, the remaining people. That evidence is going to be crucial. And if it doesn't exist at all, then, you know, good luck with that. Then you don't have much. I'll just say this. Where I stand right now and where I think we are with at, for everybody in this case, the fact that it's so polarizing right now and it's this, it's this 50-50 thing. I just think at the very start of it, the prosecution has an uphill battle proving this case. They're going to have to spend a lot of time and energy in trial um, legitimizing the investigation. And if they screwed anything up whatsoever from the chain of custody, um, from their lineup of witnesses, um, if there's any questions that linger from their investigation that gets to remain in the minds of the jury, and I guarantee you that this defense attorney is going to pick up on all of that, if there's anything like that whatsoever, the prospect of them getting conviction in this case uh, is very, very slim. Um, but before uh, we sign off on this, Eliana, I don't know. As it stands right now, would you rather be the prosecution or the defense? In this case, which is, in this case, maybe the defense. <laughs> but at the same time, I still have like this prosecution hat on most of the time. Yeah. The so, fact that you're even saying that, because normally when we do these cases, I don't know, fuck that guy. He's going to jail. <laughs> he belongs. Yeah. You're always, always, always prosecution minded. Yes. Because I think I can, I can see how, like, maybe, I don't know, these people were drunk. Maybe they did have a fight, but that's why he has like the bloated eyes and all that and other um, injuries. And maybe after that, he got out of the house and she accidentally hit him. And that, I mean, she didn't know what she was doing. She was definitely super drunk. And then maybe he died in the snow and nobody knew what was going on because everybody was so stupidly, stupidly drunk that they had no idea what well, was that's going the, on. And yeah, that's the problem with this case. It's like it, when you try to, to, to research it and really deep dive, there's not much that is known. I know that there's been a lot of theories thrown out there. And both sides are claiming that the other side is making stuff up. Mm -hmm. When you got a case like that, um, it's really difficult to see uh, the, the forest from the trees. But mm -hmm. once, look, we're not going to know anything about this case until we see how it plays out in trial. And I think that all the defense has to do, which I know they're going to do a really good job of, is every time somebody gets up there with their scientific evidence, it's going to be like, oh, these, cons these injuries are consistent with somebody that passed away in the snow. Um, and, you know, died from the elements. And then, well, isn't it also true that that person could have died from the elements because they were incapacitated because maybe he was uh, beaten up in the house and dragged out there to left for dead and, you know, unconscious and all of that. The fact that both sides are going to fit leaves this case right for reasonable doubt. Every single shred of evidence, as far as the tail light, they're getting around that by saying that the cops found it. Well, did they find it the day of? What is very important. What time did they find the tail light remnants? Was it that same day? Was it at 4.30 a.m.? Was it 6.30 a.m.? Or was it three days later? And I'm not even exactly positive on what, how that's going to come out in trial. We'll see where... I've, I've heard different versions of this story. I've heard, on the one hand, that they found it right away. I've heard, on the other hand, that it, they found it a couple of days later. So we'll, we'll know that. But the timing of that is really important. If it really is three days later, then, hey, they had three days to plant the evidence and fine. When was her tail light shattered? Mm -hmm. Was it shattered um, at 12.30 a.m.? Or was it shattered when she was backing out of her driveway trying to make her way over there that following morning? Um, mm -hmm. I have, again, I've heard stories. I have heard it argue both ways. Like, oh, she broke her taillight as she was backing out into another parked car when she was leaving her house to get there that following morning. And, of course, there's the other theory, which is while she ran over John O'Keefe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure how much value, if anything... McCabe's cell phone history really matters mm -hmm. unless you can attach that to her covering up for somebody that was either directly involved in the murder or she was involved in it herself. They're going to mm -hmm. have to tie together that loose end. Um, there's going to be a lot of um, insinuation about 
who was dating who, who was having an affair with who, um, whether or not those things were true, because it's going to lead to motive. What was the motive behind the people inside the house committing the murder? Why would they want to do this? By all accounts, John O'Keefe was like this upstanding um, salt of the earth kind of guy uh, that everybody liked. What was in it for them to kill him? She was the only one out of the entire party that went out that night that was cursing at him in a voicemail minutes after leaving the, 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 the house. There is cell phone data, GPS data that suggests that John O'Keefe was inside the house that day, that night, and that he traveled what would have been the equivalent to going up and down three flights of stairs. That house is three flights itself, three stories itself. And, um, but the people inside the house are insisting that he never went inside. Hmm. Now you're making that face and it, because it's frustrating because it's like we're, ha- we're hearing all of this evidence and like it's conflicting on both sides. Like the prosecution, they're, they're dropping st- uh, stuff in there, but then it's being contradicted. And then you start thinking, oh, well, maybe the defense is telling the truth. And then, well, that doesn't really make sense either. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if, and then there's people saying, well, they couldn't possibly because of the way the Apple and iPhone does their thing. I don't know. So how the forensics from the cell phone uh, comes into evidence is going to be crucial. Because if the jury thinks that he went inside the house, and was going up and down the stairs that night before his death. That plays into reasonable doubt because um, maybe something happened in the house. And then there's a reason why everybody in the house is denying that he ever went inside because they're obviously trying to cover something up. On the other hand, if he never went inside the house and the guy was falling down drunk and the girl just like decided to leave because they had some kind of a fight or she was pissed off or whatever, I don't know. Um, and maybe he dropped his keys, and as he dropped his keys, he wants to, goes to pick them up, and then Karen Reed just slams on the gas and 24 miles in reverse, 24 miles per hour in reverse, slams into his head, rendering him unconscious, leaving him to uh, laying there on the snow. He never goes inside the house. And nobody knows he's there because of whatever. Now, that's going to be contradicted by a lot of things. There's a lot of communications back and forth between the parties. It's going to be very important to pinpoint who was saying what, who knew what, when, whatever. I just know this. All the defense has to do is find one of the people in the house um, giving an inconsistent statement, present that to the jury. That's going to be the the, the best evidence that they're going to be able to present in terms of a cover-up. Here's something else that's really important. Um, There's this motion that was just recently granted that the defense is going to be able to introduce third-party culprit evidence during the trial. However, they're limited in the fact that they're not allowed to argue that in their opening statement. And I wanted to ask your opinion of that because usually for opening statements in a trial, you're trying to outline your case and you're promising the jury that they're going to see evidence uh, leading up to stuff, your theory of the case, right? So that means that they're not going to be able to talk about it 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 was somebody else. It wasn't Karen Reed. If he died, it was for some other reason. Uh, They're not going to be able to make the argument or not even mention in the opening statement that they think it was the people in the house. The way they have to present that is going to be is going to have to be during the evidence in a six to eight week trial. So at what point, if you're the defense attorney, do you decide that you should introduce that evidence? Do you wait right away or do you build them up for like this large crescendo? Like, oh, by the way, um, it was all of these other people. And then you argued on closing arguments. How would you approach that? I don't know, to be sincere. <laughs> it's, I don't know. I, I think, well, here's I what I would do. Of, yeah. Yeah. I, I just don't, cause I, I really don't know. You have to get, you have to get that in right away. I think, I, I think that your, your first couple of witnesses is going to be, I mean, the defense can't, the, the prosecution goes first. But as soon as the defense has the opportunity to do so, they have to make it relevant, their theory of the case, which is um, John O'Keefe was murdered in the house. And if he wasn't murdered right uh, directly, he was rendered unconscious or incapacitated and left for dead in the snow. And then they have to get that in somehow, but they got to do it right away. They cannot wait six to eight weeks. It has to be in the juror's head for the entire trial as long as they possibly can. Um, otherwise, I feel like that evidence is going to fall flat. But if you're creating reasonable doubt, it's best to plant the seed right away. And then you start watering it in with 
other evidence and, and, and uh, witnesses and things like that. But that's what they're going to have to do. Um, just an interesting side note. So that's their theory of the case. Um, they've created chaos. And the reason why you know that it's so effective is because it's difficult when we do these podcasts. Usually we have it all like laid out right in here. But the way that we've had to present this case is that like there's all kinds of wild accusations going on. There's a turtle boy guy. There's like witness intimidation. There's a federal uh, investigation going on with all of these things. Um, there's so much that is um, just creating noise and distractions from this case. And like I said, in, until we see how it's going to come out in trial, we're not going to really know or understand what's going on. Because I really think that a lot of this that has gone out that is in the public consciousness right now is I bet you the majority of it is just like made up stuff. I mean, there's there is some things that are, that are irrefutable. I mean, a lot of that's like the autopsy photos, um, some of the normal uh, stuff that we get from police investigations or whatnot. But like these crazy theories, conspiracy theories, there's literally people like writing fiction about this case, like these articles, um, like uh, like creating short stories from the events that happened this night that is out there on the internet that I feel like people are picking up and like trying to turn it into truth. So it's a crazy case. Um, my personal opinion is that I think that it's going to be a tough case for the prosecution to win. I think that at the end of the day, Karen Reed is going to be acquitted because of all of the noise that her defense attorneys are going to create with respect to everything that's going on. And I think that the prosecution has their hands full. It's going to be a tough, tough case to win. I do, I do not envy their position. Um, what do you think about it, Eliana? And then we'll wrap up this segment. I, I agree. It's going to be tough. I think it's going to be, like you said, she's going to get acquitted as long as he proves at least one inconsistent statement from all these theories. Um, I mean, from one of the witnesses that uh, corroborates not corroborates, but kind of confirms uh, one of his uh, theories, and it's going to be hard. I think he's doing a really good job, and like I said, I'm always on the prosecution prosecution side, but I I can see that this defense attorney is doing the right thing and confusing everybody. And well, that's the that's move because he's doing a bang up job with that, and so. <laughs> Good luck with all of that. We will monitor this case as it comes out because I, I promise you this is going to be probably one of the, mo the, the most entertaining trials um, probably of the last 10 years, the way that everything's going down. Um, but Elena, I know what you got to get out of here. You got family stuff to take care of. We're going to sign off now and let you get to your thing. I'm going to end up doing family law after dark uh, with Melissa. So um, we're going to substitute your uh, super lawyer knowledge uh, with uh, Melissa's uh, real-world layperson advice, I guess. I don't know, and see how it goes. But um, I guess we will see you next week then. See you next week. Any bye closing bye. thoughts to uh, all of your fans? Oh, no. <laughs> I just really need to go. I have a lot of stuff right. going on. <laughs> Get out of here. We'll see you, we'll, 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 uh, we'll see you next week then. Okay, bye. All right, bye-bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I am joined by Melissa Pacheco. You might know her, remember her from our Christopher Watts, Nicole Kessinger mock trial that we did roughly about a month ago. She played the part of Nicole Kessinger. She's here to join us on Family Law After Dark. It's the second time she's been on in this segment. She's going to be filling in for Ileana, who is doing family stuff. Um, and we got some interesting cases to get through. Um, I have a member submission that we're going to start off with. One of our most loyal followers, but she uh, wanted us to, uh, oh, hold on. So we have a audience submission for our family law after dark and let's just get started with this so this is her situation i'm very curious about what you have to think or what you have to say about this melissa yes because um i feel like you could probably relate to this a lot better than i can <laughs> i'm gonna let you give your thoughts i think her mic is muted oh i'm gonna let you give your thoughts oh i'm gonna let you give your thoughts i already know what i'm gonna say but I'm curious about how you would, what you would say to this. Okay. Um, I already know that you're, I kind of already have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but here we go. 
So good afternoon. Really love your show. I've never done this before, so bear with me. Um, I work for a huge retail company. I am part of a market team. The role I play on this team is to ensure we are doing everything we can and we can everything we can do to keep shrink down. Oh, theft, safety, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm in charge of six locations. So I'm in the stores often. So I had an associate come up to me and he told me he had been having problems on a shift with some of the managers doing some things that they shouldn't be doing. I took him in the office with another coach. We talked it out of the course and uh, I took care of his problem. He was so grateful he seemed harmless. So I gave him my number and I told him, if you have any more problems, just get a hold of me and we will take care of it. I really wasn't worried about giving him my number. I do this a lot with people I know I can help uh, so they can come to me. Um, I do my best to fix whatever the issue is. All right. So, however, last week when I was in the building while I was in the middle of looking at some safety issues, I felt like someone was staring at me. When I turned around, it was the dork. She's called him the dork. Um, a little mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but this, he, well, he's the dork. Um, did I lose my spot? However, last week I was in, yeah. He asked me if he could tell me something. I should have said no. However, I said, sure. He tells me, did you know 90% of the men in this store looks at you? I said, no, I really didn't notice. He said, they stare because you're beautiful and they want to be with you. I told him, thanks for the compliment. I told him I needed to get back to work. After that, I noticed I would see him everywhere I was. I thought maybe he is just a harmless, dorky loser. Well, to shorten this up, he asked me, could I be his Happy Meal, Jesus Christ. His happy what? His happy meal. Ugh, that's what oh, she says. My God. Um, I screwed something up. I told him, uh, he asked me, did I wake up with someone's head between my legs? He said, I want you to be my good girl. First of all, why on earth do you think I would relate to this? That's disgusting. Because I'm sure you're a female that probably gets approached by guys with all kinds of different approaches. I don't know. Okay, no. Thank God, no. Thank God, nothing like this has happened to me, but what is she particularly asking for? Um, well, let us continue. Um, all the while, I have absolutely told him no to all of it. I had to block his number. He would apologize for saying something so disgusting, and then he would do it again. He did that about five times. Today was the last straw. I was working, but I had one earbud in, earbud in, and I heard this guy walk up to the, to the dork and say, where's your girl? Where's your girl? And he pointed, me, he pointed at me, WTF. So I walked up to the guy and I said, what did you say? He said, the dork said, you're his girl. I got so frustrated, I humiliated him. I promised him I'm not a mean person, but he is so gross. So I told the guy in front of the dork, he could never be with me. There's not a chance in hell. He is short, fat, dork. Uh, oh. Well, that's pretty humiliating. Mm -hmm. He was absolutely, he has absolutely no game. I'm sorry for all the cringy things you had to hear. He definitely said much worse. Um, a little more about this guy. He is 26. He lives with his mom. I really was trying to chalk it up to maybe a maturity, but he was saying he was going to be my Christian gray. Uh, he would... Say, be my good girl. Mr. Gray would never. I'm just going to leave us there. I've never watched that movie. Um, it's just uncomfortable and gross. I did really embarrass him. When I did tell his coworkers I wasn't his girlfriend, uh, I hope that puts him in check, but I have no... I told him absolutely never going to happen. Um, he says, okay, but just know that the offer is still on the table if I ever change my mind, so that's what I'm dealing with. Um, and her question is, is there anything I can do legally to help with the situation? Hey, Dominic, so how do you approach girls? <laughs> What's your move? Usually I don't. I let them come to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that is the problem with the uh, generation. Uh, what generation are we in now? It's not millennials anymore, is it? It's uh, Gen Z. No, we're past that one as well. Are we? Yeah, I think we're past that one. What are we? After 2020, I think they cut it and a well, new one came in. Born in like, he's 20, Dominic's like 25. <laughs> he's a millennial. No. Gen Z. <clears throat> Gen Z then. <clears throat> Either way. Your ex, 
I'm a millennial, and then he's a Gen Z. Here's what I got to say about it. Look, there's a there's guys. I feel like this is what I feel like. I feel like most men have no idea how to approach a woman that they are interested in. And I feel like men, more so than women, have to learn how to get over these rejections that they're constantly having. This guy's not attractive. He's, she says, according to her, she's like a... Well, she's describing him as the dork, so... Oh, yeah. yeah. I think that she's probably angry that this guy's... A, that would... I'll just tell you what. Um... If that's your move, that's like your go-to move, to call somebody a happy meal and like saying these grotesque sexual things and thinking you're going to get anywhere with women, that's that's not the move. That's never been the move. Um, but I know uh, that, you know, being female and they're approached by women like this or men like this. I've seen guys on YouTube, like remember the pickup artists and things? And they would go and they would, oh, I know how to talk to women and get them to do whatever I want. And then we go and like display their... their um, I don't know their moves or their approaches, but there's other people that are self-described incels, involuntary celibate males who are very angry towards women. <clears throat> and most men, when they approach women, um, have varying degrees of success with them. But even the least successful is going to be is going is going to find a winner one out of a hundred times. It's just you got to get through all of the rejection to get there. But some just have no idea and they're they're having to deal with all of this rejection and that manifests itself in violence towards women, which is a lot like what it sounds like this guy is doing. I feel like he already knows <clears throat> that he's going to be rejected by this lady. And he knows he's probably never going to get into like this sexual environment with her where he's able to, I guess, I don't know, put on all of his, his moves, his Christian Grey moves or whatever. Um, and so he just leads with that because it's the closest he's going to get. But he's living in this fantasy world. He's telling, he's telling co-workers, oh, that's my girlfriend, and I don't know what that's about, but you know who, to, who it reminds me of. Um, Melissa, help me out. Who was the guy that was the girlfriend of one of the cases we just did where she just got out of prison? You wanted to be on the podcast, remember? It was, um, oh, who was it? She was uh, Munchausen by proxy victim. Okay, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me a lot of Gypsy Rose uh -huh. and her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Her boyfriend was really heavy into uh, sadomasochistic, like uh, that kind of stuff, yeah. calling people good girl and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and he created for himself this fantastic uh, fantasy world of sexual innuendo and intrigue. And he was like a vampire and um, this very powerful dark and light, dark and light type of thing. Um, but he would say things like that and he would talk to the, like that to her and like um, espousing his sexual prowess. Yeah. And it was just how, I don't know, he liked it. Um, this guy is 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 doing the same thing, but it's like his his first move, and so it's just a little bit, a, a little bit different. Where did I leave off? If a guy approached you like that, Melissa, what would you do? I'm gonna sound like an a hole. Why? I would laugh in his face so bad. I would feel bad for laughing, but I would be like that. That would be my first reaction. Just like burst out laughing. Would you think that he was joking? First, I would think that he was joking. Yeah. Like, are you putting me on? Like, what are we doing right now? I, 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 swear, I would feel so bad, really, because I would, like, burst out laughing like that, and then he would have a poker face, and I would be like, oh, my God, it was serious. No, he would, yeah, but I would think that he was, would you think that he was mentally ill? Because yes. that's not like, yes. of all the times that you get approached by men, like, how often do they lead with that? Do you want to be my happy meal? <laughs> you, you see? <laughs> Never. <laughs> mm. I could just tell you this. I don't know what my moves were, but it wasn't that. That's disgusting. Yeah. Hold on, I gotta get up. Like I said, nine times out of ten, somebody's that girl's gonna think you're joking. Like that would have been my first thought. He's joking. How would you advise this young lady? 
as me yeah. or as a paralegal? Well, here's what I would say as a man. If I was like her brother, say, first of all, who is this guy? Does, yes. does he need a talking to? Do I, do I need to get involved? Uh, number two, um, that is sexual harassment. Yes. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, of a, uh, sexual harassment. Harassment in the workplace as well. Yeah, sexual harassment in the workplace. Mm -hmm. That's a civil lawsuit. Um, I don't know what state that she lives in, but that's an easy restraining order. If he's if he is conducting himself that way, you got to go to HR and let them know because if they don't do anything about it, they could be culpable civilly if they don't do anything to remedy about it or to remedy it. Like for example, I was actually going to mention a civil harassment um, order. Put on like. Um, Put you guys on different work shifts. Uh, maybe he works uh, night shift. You work the day shift. Um, make sure that you guys are never in the same place. Maybe they just fire him for cause because that you can't be sexually harassing people in 24 um, in that kind of way. And, and in the most corny possible way, Jesus Christ, have you ever woke? Do you, do you wake up with someone's head between your legs? <laughs> You as a boss, how would you handle that? Fire. Let's say you had a, a big crew of staff. Unequivocally uh, fired on the spot. It's done. I mean, I would get his story. Like, did you say these things? It sounds like there's a lot of witnesses. And then um, I would probably just fire him. It's done. I'm not going to let women in my office uh, feel like they are not safe. Or have to be putting up with somebody like this saying these grotesque sexual things uh, to them that hasn't been earned. Like, hey, do whatever you want to do with your, your girlfriend or whatever. But you don't lead with, uh, do you wake up with somebody between your legs? <laughs> do you want to play Fifty Shades of Grey with me? Okay, no. I can be your Christian Grey. I'm really, I'm really trying to not take this seriously, but oh my God. That's disgusting, man. And what's like the, okay. I said, Mr. Gray would never. What is with the good girl thing? I never. I, when people say that, when I hear that phrase, I, I can't. I hate it so bad. What phrase? When people say, "Oh, good girl," it's like, who the fuck are you? To say that, just like, what are you talking about? Like, I I instantly like want to fight the guy that says that. I just, I just don't like. I don't know. I feel like it's the most disrespectful thing you can say to a woman that is not like your wife or girlfriend. And you don't have like that kind of relation. I don't know. It's just so cringe. Well, I grew up. Oh my God, it's going to be really hard for me to say this in English. So bear with me because it's not my first language, but I'm trying. I grew up with a lot of media, books, literature, all that kind of stuff. Of cre Well, yeah, I grew up when creative nonfiction was like a huge thing. That means... Twilight, that means vampire Jesus. diary. Exactly, Jesus. So in those books, because I've read pretty much all of them, you can find those phrases like slam across the text all the time. And us girls would grow up like, oh, that's the greatest thing ever. Are you saying that that's a normalized statement for you when somebody says that? Okay, not now that I'm almost but back 30. Then when but you were... back then when I was like 16. Wow, you're 70. almost 30? Jesus Christ. The hell happened to you? Nothing. I, I am not commenting on that. <laughs> when, I knew, when, I, when I met Melissa, she was like 25 years I, old. I she was like a baby, still an undergrad. I was 25. And he asked me, uh, let me know about you. Are you married? And I was like, ew, no, I'm 25. In my, now I'm 30. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny how quickly that happens. Let that sink in. But yeah, if you would, like, if you, if you would talk to somebody that's also my age, who grew up in that generation, they would say the same thing. I swear to God, that was such a normalized phrase back then. Really? I swear. Hey, Dominic, what do you think? Is that no, is, is that the move? No, he's from a different generation. No. Right now, somebody approaches me like that, and I'm like... Dominic is a good dude, man. He's not going to be, like, spouting off some nonsense like that. <laughs> and if he did, he's highly intoxicated. <laughs> he's possibly been roofied. <laughs> Either way, long story short, this guy has issues. Um, I sympathize with him on this level. He's probably... An incel. He sounds like one. Incels talk like that. They have what? this extreme violence to involuntarily celibate male. Like they want to have sex with women, but women just will not because they're freaking weird. And they don't know how to approach women. They don't know how to talk to women. Is that a gringo thing? No, that's a that's a pop culture thing. It's um 
men that have been so uh, disenchanted with the prospect of dating women successfully that they've now converted their frustrations into violence towards women. If they're not outrightly violent towards women, then it manifests in the way that they talk to women and they overly sexualize every single woman that they come across. Um, somebody they just meet in the stores, a, a coworker. And um, instead of like, hey, I ain't doing anything. Want to go grab some lunch later? It turns in, have you ever woke up with somebody in between your legs? Freaking idiot. That phrase sounds actually, well, not that phrase, that term sounds actually way nicer than what we say in Spanish. I'm just going to leave it there. Mom, your Hispanic people know what I'm talking about. I am Hispanic and I don't know what the F you're talking about. <laughs> just leave it there. I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to say it out loud. You don't have to. Um, but for our dear listener, um, that's all I really have to say about this. Just be careful. Hey, go to HR. Um, consider filing a civil harassment restraining order to get him away from you. You don't have to put up with that kind of good stuff. And you can actually do um, it on your own. Um, I don't know what state you are, like Gomer said, but most likely if you would approach um, the closest courthouse you have, there's a self-help resource center where they can assist you with everything. Yeah, Melissa's my paralegal. She knows all about this stuff. Um, I'll just say this. Uh, do not write this guy off as just an inconvenience. Because he's the kind of guy where it could get real dangerous, regardless of whether or not how dorky he looks. Just be careful and make sure uh, you tell people what's going on. Don't ever be alone with him um, if you can help it and um, protect yourself. Civil harassment order, immediately go to HR. I'd imagine they're going to fire him on the spot. And you might feel bad about that, but you don't have to put up with that kind of stuff. That's your remedy. Um, all right, moving on. So this guy is 40 years old. Um, he's un unable to forgive his wife who's 39 and can't stand being in the room with her. This is going to be good. I only wrote a book. Is that one new? Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So about a year ago, I was out running errands. My wife was asleep. The kids were playing. It was a Sunday. She finally woke up at 1130. Jesus. I'm, does he mean a.m.? Hey, we're not judging. Keep going. I'm judging. What I, you know, last time I, do you know the last time I was able to sleep in until 11:30 a.m. When you were like 15. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my undergrad years probably. I couldn't even. Man, like the whole day is gone. Like, what do you even do? She works the night shift. Dominic now. totally sleeps until. <laughs> <laughs> He's young. Like the sun's about to go down, man. You need, hey, seize the day, buddy. It's one thing to wake up at 25. It's quite another to wake up at 45 and half the day is gone. You only get so many of them. Um, all right. So she called and asked me where I was. I shared my location. I was in Home Depot or next door at the diner eating. Well, which one was it? Um, I was 30 minutes away. She demanded I come home right that second, basically upset. She woke up and I wasn't home. Hmm. I've been up since 630 doing errands exercising, getting the kids settled. I left out at 10 a.m. I take care of the kids mainly because I have a flexible schedule. My wife works part-time. I make two times more than her also. I know where this is going. Um, well, I take an hour to get home. She starts calling, yelling at me, saying I'm worthless, and if I don't want to be around the family, she's going to take the kids and leave. And ever since then, me knowing how family courts are, I felt like I am living with an assassin. She has the target on me and is just waiting to pull the trigger. I told her numerous times her statements and threats that day highly affected me. I've been to therapy. I told my therapist, my wife, my friends, and parents all told me I need to get over it and I'm being sensitive. Obviously, my wife was just upset and apologized. Even my therapist said she apologized. Why isn't that enough? So it's been a year. I'm still not over it. Everyone, including my wife, are acting like everything is great. We just took a week vacation in February as a family. I was there, but I feel like I can't even properly openly speak to my wife anymore because battle lines have been drawn. <sighs> Am I the asshole for holding my wife's statements a year later and unable to forgive her? I am acting like everything is fine to avoid interacting with her. I took a second job in the evening. All right. I knew this was going to be an am I the asshole question. Yeah. Um, what would you say to this guy? I don't know. I may sound so insensitive. Just well, get now the time. It. Hey, no cursing on that. Hey, Dominic, bleep it out. 
and my the bleep the you know what you know what to do. <laughs> you could curse, just Dominic has to bleep. Get over it. Um I don't know. A lot of it goes back what to What phase um, in her cycle was she? Maybe she was upset, maybe she no, was don't, hungry. Don't I blame, don't know. Not even don't blame it on that. Not not nope, nope. Hey. Nope. Nope. Because <sighs> up and my husband's nowhere to be seen i would be pissed at 11 30 I, I don't care hey man okay i'm not defending her by the way but i, I would be pissed i wake up well it doesn't matter when i wake up my kids wake up at seven mm-hmm. whether it's a monday or a saturday yeah they don't care 7 a.m and that's just how it is my wife and i have not slept in since they've been born and even on vacation when we wake up on vacation we just automatically wake up at that time because we're just conditioned. It's the internal alarm clock that yeah. happens. So 11.30 is a little... I don't know how old these kids are. How old are they? Did I miss that? No, no. He didn't mention it. All right. Assuming that they are younger kids, because why else would he would he care? Um, I'm going to see his point. I've been up since 30. I was running errands. I was exercising. He says, getting the kids settled. I left out at 10 a.m. Hmm. He says, I take care of the kids because of my flexible schedule. It sounds like his kids are probably older. Maybe like 12. This seems like an isolated incident. Unless unless this is happening like um, on an ongoing basis. That's what I've been saying. And every single, you're right. Maybe she was just on a rag. Maybe she's at, which, hey, it happens. The other night I came home and my wife was like having a full meltdown. Not even a meltdown. When I say meltdown with my wife, it's extremely mild. It's like um, she was just frustrated with the kids and she was like exhausted and all that kind of stuff. And, I don't blame her. Yeah. And, and so, but that's as bad as it gets. And she just needed a moment to vent. And my job was to shut the fuck up and like hold her hand. And um, just wait. We went to dinner and then she calmed down and it was better. But I've learned how to do that. You know, I don't take it personal. Sometimes she just has to vent. Uh, sometimes when I have to vent, I just need to be left alone. It's just, it's a thing that happens. Maybe sometimes your wife just needs to sleep in until 1130. Maybe she was having a moment. Maybe she was feeling fat because she was bloated and, you know, on her stuff. And maybe she was having a, uh, in a lot of pain, her lower back or whatever. And she just needed, she had like a migraine maybe. Hey, um, but to take it to level 10 though and say, I will take the kids from me. I could see how that would rattle a man. There are some lines that you don't cross with your partner. And what she did, it's not that she slept in until 11.30. It was the, um, like he says, I feel like I'm living with an assassin. Those are wars of, those, those are words of a declaration of war. When you say to a man that I will take your kids, how do you expect that to uh, land with him? How would you say that to your husband? No, I wouldn't. That's a line that you would never cross, right? No. Like, there's lines that I won't cross with my wife. There's lines that she won't cross with me because those crossing that line is a declaration of war. Boundaries. When she says um, she's calling him worthless, and if I don't want to be around the family, she's going to take the kids and leave, that reeks to me of a man who regularly bails and leaves her alone with the kids. I was going to go to that, but I didn't want to mention it. But Why not? Yeah, it sounds that way. Because this is the time to get real with this guy. Because if that happens one time and that's it, I don't think she's going to react like that. Like I said, she may get pissed because she woke up and he's nowhere to be found. But like, all of a sudden, saying that, no. Well, there's certain rules when you have kids, you know, especially when they're younger. You don't just leave your partner alone to like, uh, like I don't just go out and have, oh, I'm going to go play poker with the guys. My ass is home every night at a certain time, no matter what. But you're, they're young. Doesn't matter. This kid sound make me like 12. I don't know if they're 12. They might be five, four and five for all I know. They could be 16. But the point is, if he's regularly leaving and going about and doing his business and leaving her to tend to the house, I could see where that would, where, where that would grate on a woman. What woman do you know just leads with, I will take the kids and leave? Or has that been, like, she's been building up to that, and this effing guy keeps on doing it? What do you think? 
I think she has been building up. Because nobody, like I said, nobody starts that way out of the blue. Yeah. And so they've been to therapy. He's holding on to this one thing. And I think that he just got a bit of reality. Look, the danger for, the danger for getting married for men, it's not just that you're going to lose half of your stuff. You know, that's what this guy says. He makes like two times more than her. She works part time, whatever. He's going to give her child support and alimony and all this stuff. It's this perceived notion that, you know, how people stay married because of the kids. It's not because they think the kids can't handle getting divorced. It's because they're afraid of losing access to the children. And how many clients do we have uh, that come to us and, oh, she's not letting me see the kids. I just want to have 50-50. She's saying I, I have to have supervised visitation. How many people do you see whose ex take that position because of a million different reasons, spite, ego, whatever it is? It's more common that you like. So when you threaten a man like that, you're threatening him with, it's not just an idle threat. And it resonated with him in a way that he can't get over. And I understand that aspect of it. But at the same time, I'm not going to pretend like she probably doesn't have some severe grievances on her end as well. The way that he was up at 630. And look, maybe he, maybe he does that all the time. Rumor, but it sounds, well, maybe he did not discuss this part of the story. But... I mean, he could have talked to her about it like, hey, I'm going to tell you something. I really don't like what you said, and I really... Well, they've been in therapy. So I'm assuming they've had the, that conversation. So the fact that he's holding on to it, um, I'm not so sure that it's as easy as get over it because when you make a declaration of war, like, look, if there's there's certain things that you, you if you say that to me, then you are you will be forever written off. And there's no going back. Like, I will never get in the same headspace with you ever again. Because if you could even threaten me that way, then I will keep my distance. Men are very often that way because men are uniquely equipped or forced to endure in this universe rejection of the highest order. Always, all the time. The second that you hit a man with a threat of that level of rejection, there's something in your brain that registers... And it's usually a defense mechanism. And that's what I feel like is going on with this guy. He's not innocent. She's not innocent. But I understand what he is saying. He can't get over the fact that she would say something like that. Think back to the worst argument you've ever had with your husband. You're not even married yet. You're a fiance. Um, the one that you can't get out of your head. The one that resonates. Every time you're mad at him, you go back and you think about that one thing that he said that one time. Every couple, most couples have that one thing that's the, the, the worst memory you could possibly think of in your relationship that they have and they hold on to. It's not because you want to. It's just that your brain is not letting you let it go. And those are usually based in psychological defense mechanisms that manifest over your lifetime of insecurities and rejections. So, is he the asshole for holding that against her? Um, he's not the asshole, but perhaps he shouldn't. Look, it's one thing to hold on to that. It's quite another to let it to continue to affect the relationship. If you're not going to bail on the marriage, then you have to condition yourself. If you can't get rid of it altogether to learn to live with it so that it doesn't affect the marriage. Otherwise, you're doomed to failure. You're doomed to repeat. Because if it's at this level one year later, it's not going to be any different five years later unless you learn to acknowledge and forgive. There has to be forgiveness. You don't have to forget, but you have to forgive. Otherwise, your marriage is doomed. Your children will be doomed to the possibility that your wife, who is your age, is going to, in actuality, in reality, take away your access from the kids because of something that blows up years down the road because you haven't learned how to forgive. And understand what I say. There's a difference between forgiveness and forgetting. You don't have to forget that it was said. If you guys actually find yourself in war, that little tidbit there in the tool chest is still going to be there. But you have to find a way if you're going to continue to build this castle to not let it be an impediment to your success. And I'm just going to end it with that. Dominic, what would you tell this guy? You said to forgive, but don't forget because I think you're right. With men, we like to, as soon as something like that is said, 
we like to put up a barrier and kind of keep our distance. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important. So, uh, that was a good one. That was, um, I like that one. Melissa was all ready to tell this guy, yeah, why don't you just grow a pair? It's like, yeah, hold I on a minute. It's because I communicate really good with my husband. That's why. And every single time I'm pissed at something, I don't blow up in his face. I just wait. Yeah, but everybody it. commu- everybody Th- that gets it's married. It's different, exactly. It's not even that it's different. Like, everybody that, in, that ends up getting married at some level communicated well enough to get married. You start off well, but you're communicating without all of the landmines. Once you get married, you have to learn how to communicate while the universe is coming for you. Children, money, taxes, bills, health problems. In-laws. Everything. In-laws. The universe is converging to destroy you. And if you don't have the ability to communicate in those dire straits, then you're going to have issues in your marriage. That's just how it is. But let's move on before we get too much in the weeds with that one. Um, all right. Seeking realistic advice about starting over in your 30s. All right. So I found out my husband cheated on me. I'm currently eight weeks pregnant. Oh. He cheated this week. We haven't told anyone yet about the pregnancy or the cheating. I'm at a loss on what to do. I'm in my 30s, and the thought of starting over sounds terrible as I'm fully ready to be settled down. Uh, But I don't know if I can trust him anymore. Has anyone been in a similar situation and can offer advice? Well, um, I don't know if he knows that she's pregnant or not. Why does that matter? Uh, Well, it doesn't, except it kind of, it's one thing to cheat on your spouse. It's quite another to cheat while you know that she's pregnant and you have another on the way. I don't know. What would you tell this lady? Are you asking me or Dominic? You're the one sitting across me from the mic. (laughs) Well, it's true. It's one thing to cheat on your partner, and then it's another one to cheat on your partner while she's pregnant with your child. It's two different, very different levels of betrayal. I don't know how long she's been married for. Doesn't matter if it was a month, a year, a day, whatever. It does. She's pregnant. Um... It's not yet. Uh, they're not even past miscarriage state, so that might may or may not be a viable pregnancy. I think twelve weeks is the benchmark. Ten to twelve weeks. I don't know about that. But well, I know about that. Yeah, I know. So, um, that's tough. Okay, so let's say that. So the thirty years old. Let's just assume that they got married at twenty eight. She just said thirties. That's it. She didn't specify what thirty. Oh, you're right. Maybe I'm just looking at it. Uh, from uh, in rose colored glasses, but yeah, your 30s you cheat on you, eight weeks pregnant. Um, so when there is infidelities in the marriage, you have to make the decision about whether or not um, you're going to carry on with the relationship clearly. So trust has been breached, and I don't know if she's confronted this guy with it or not. She said we when she was. We haven't always oh, should just say we, yeah. Um, well, look, if you cannot live in your marriage and you know yourself and you know that you can't live in the marriage with the knowledge that he has gone out and violated the vows um, and you're never going to be the same um, and you want to get divorced, then now is the time because you don't have any time to waste. Because you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to be like 45 years old um, with like a 10-year-old and an ex-husband and all of this baggage. And your, your value to the up open market is going to be, uh, well, very low. Not only that, the people that are available or wanting to get married in their mid to late, uh, mid, mid 30s to say late 40s and beyond is, is very small. Most people that are that age have already been married and don't want to get married again. And so this lady gets divorced, she's going to become one of them. So you have to make a decision. Do you want to stay married or not? Was this like a one-time thing uh, with your husband or is this something that uh, maybe... Um, yeah, that's another thing I was going to point out. It's two different things if this was a one-night thing or if this is an ongoing relationship like with somebody else. It's two, two different 
very, at least for me, it's two very different things. If we were, look, it's very easy to just say, oh, yeah, definitely get a divorce. Fine. Um, but you have very real ramifications for that now. One is you're, you're very likely, uh, you're, put it this way, it's very unlikely that she's going to find a successful marriage partner after all of this. There's almost no chance. There's, well, not that there's no chance. It's just very small. It's going to be difficult. And she's going to be having to do it as a single parent with an ex. And who knows what kind of co-parent he's going to be. It's just difficult. Secondly, um, she wants to be settled down. This is really kind of her chance. And so I don't know how long. Maybe it's one of these scenarios where they've been together since they're 18. Um, and the guy was, uh, you know, he gained a little bit of weight because they've been in the same relationship for the last 17 years. And uh, all of a sudden he starts working out like a Christopher Watts scenario and he starts getting attention from all these different women. And then uh, he has like a moment of weakness, but he like swears up and down, he'll never do it again. Or maybe it's just like this dipshit that's just always going to perennially be on the prowl for other women and there's nothing that she can really do about it. That deserves a conversation. Look, I've seen people married under all kinds of different scenarios yes. in this office. I've seen people in open marriages, and they're very happy in open marriages. I've seen people that have, like, these weird, um, I don't know, lifestyles that they go by, and, and, you know, they're very happy doing that. I've seen people that um, have remained successfully married even after discovering that something like this happened because they talked and they became open sexually. And usually what happens is like they'll have this discussion and then they, for the very first time start becoming open about their sexuality and what they desire and what they don't. And it becomes like this very healing thing, like conversations that they've never had together starts being had. And then it just creates like a brand new lifestyle for them or a new way of being married or, or newfound understanding with, with somebody. I say all the time on the show, when you get married to somebody, you get married to all of them, all of the things that are seen and all of the things that are unseen. And their family. And their family and all those things. But from this, look, if they do stay together, it's either going to be under the same terms as before. Oh, I promise I'll never do, do this ever again. And we're going to be monogamous together, whatever, fine. Or it's going to become, it's going to come with this new found understanding of sexual exploration and this new re renewed commitment towards each other where they could carry on because they now have a child to raise and they got married because they chose each other and they have this child and they don't want to just let it all go because dipshit was being, you know, whatever uh, back then. Um, now they could be open and honest with everything, and they have more communication, more meaningful communication, and they know how to stay married forever. Yeah, so look, you can choose to get divorced. Just look, from a family law perspective, how does it normally work out when you have to file um, for custody orders while the child is basically in utero? We actually had that case. We have a lot of cases like that. And, and the way it works is you go, all right, well, who's going to be the primary parent? And then the dad usually wants 50-50 custody. And it's like, well, I can't give him 50-50 custody because I'm breastfeeding. And he has to be with his mom. It's like, yeah, that might be true. But dad also has a right uh, to uh, raise the child as well. And there's formula. And then the courts start getting involved. And they start dictating terms of how you're going to raise your child in his most tender years. It's difficult. And it sucks. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. Uh, the child should be breastfed, especially if you're going to do that and you don't want to put them on formula. There's a very regimented way of raising your child. I've done it with my wife and you have to, you know, I mean, there's definitely ways to do it because you could pump and like freeze milk and things like that. But it requires a very attentive co-parent. I don't know what kind of co-parent he's going to be. It's just really, really difficult. And you're going to be dealing with that for the entirety of the child's lifetime. And that child's going to be raised and brought into all of this. And it wasn't his fault. And it's your husband's fault. He's the one that cheated. This, this is the reality that you're facing. But if you want to get divorced, that's what you're looking at. So it's either that. I'll just say this. If you think that there is any modicum of a possibility that you can resolve this, if you think that it can be resolved by working out your communication issues, and I'm not trying to say, um, like, absolve him of cheating. I'm just sim simply stating that I have seen people come out of your specific situation and make it work. And the way that it happens is through improved communication. 
specifically in the areas that you guys were willing to explore prior to all of this nonsense happening. And so I don't know what's going on with him that made him do that. He might have been doing it, um, cheating on you for years, and you just barely found out about it. That's possible. Or it was a one-time thing. Point is, in this one paragraph that you've given me, I don't have nearly enough to give an informed decision. I'm just stating that you don't have to make any rash decisions. Marriage is usually a really long process. The child's not even here yet. He's got another 44 weeks, not 44 weeks, 32 weeks to go uh, yeah. before he uh, is full term. Uh, so take your time with it and uh, get yourself in therapy. Start having some real honest conversations with your husband probably for the first time ever and see where you guys want to go because anybody could bail at any time. It takes a lot of work to maintain a marriage and continue to build a family. And it's oftentimes necessary to go through these kinds of moments of turmoil because you're either going to come together stronger because of it or you're going to fall apart. That's really one or the other. And if it falls apart, then fine. Lots of people have, have been in your situation and survived and your child will be fine. He will be fine. You will be fine. But if you have designs on wanting to settle down, um, if you can stomach it and you could go through what it costs to fix your communication issues and forgive and rediscover, because really that's what's going to have to happen. These old vows are broken. You're going to have to make new promises and commitments to each other. And it's going to have to be based on new understandings of the people that you've become, whom you may or may not be familiar with. You knew him. Or you think of him how he was before you got married. He's I not just, that guy anymore. He just made like a quote, like indirectly, you just quoted Sex in the City. Get out of here. No, you did. Who? I swear to God. What did I say? <laughs> when you said those vows are broken. My God. You just quoted Miranda in the movie. I think it was the second movie. No. Sorry. No, it's the first movie. When you... her husband confessed that he had cheated on her because he did confess. And then they went through therapy, and then she literally said, those vows are broken. And then he said, <laughs> she literally said that, and then he says, fine, I broke a vow. But what about the other vows? What happened to those? Melissa? Just stay quiet. Hey, what? Never quote Sex on the City on, my, on this show I ever again. Miranda. Okay. <laughs> oy, oy, oy. I, I didn't do it. You did. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we got another 20 minutes or so. Uh, so um, this one is, I don't know what this is about. Am I the asshole for forwarding my husband's group text messages to our boss and HR? She said forwarding? Yeah. Okay. I'm already going to say yes, but let's read what she has to say. I need contacts. So she's 36. My husband is 39. We're likely going to divorce. We've been married seven years. And a year and two months ago, I gave birth to our daughter. My husband and I work at the same company and at the same department. Until very recently, I worked as an administrative assistant there while my husband is a marketing associate. I was recently promoted to marketing analyst, which is one step below associate, my husband was part of an all-male friend group in the department that I believe is to help him at his work. His friend group includes a VP of marketing who we'll call Ted. Ted's boss is the senior VP of marketing. This sounds very bad. Okay, keep going. I actually got to know Allison because uh, I used to volunteer at the same school she sent her kids to. I know enough about her to know she hates people who disparage moms. For about a year... After I gave birth, I was focused on getting myself back on track, health-wise and professionally. However, my husband started getting distant after month six. Every day it was no con every day it was no conversation, but you can't do anything sexually and him bothering me for BJs. None of my accomplishments seemed to matter to my husband because he just wanted sex. He fell asleep one day before his phone turned off. I saw a host of notifications and then discovered a text thread between him and three work buddies complaining about his apparently frigid wife. Yee. I saw responses where everybody sympathized with him, saying they hope he gets sex soon. 
And then one coworker writes, at some point she just needs to lay back and let you do what you need to do and get over it. Not PC, but true. Ted liked that text. Then Ted responds, she's ruining your family. Maybe he'll tell that and she'll come to her senses. My wife did. This leads advice on ways to emotionally guilt me. I was furious, I would imagine, um, and started taking screenshots. I was slightly drunk, and when I told my sister, she said, since he participated using our electronics, just send it to Allison via his phone because she should know what kind of people is handling company PR. Hmm. So I did, without any message, explaining it, and then also sent a formal email to HR. I then leave the house. The next day, all hell breaks loose. My husband's group gets noticed notices for meetings with HR. My husband tells me to stay away and that a good wife would have kept it quiet. Now the dust has settled and Allison made it clear she was narrowly outvoted when pushing for his termination. The guy who wrote the just laid back was fired. Ted was suspended without pay but reinstated. My husband was suspended, reprimanded, and moved to a different team because Ted doesn't want to work with him. He claims what hurts most is that coworkers avoid him. My husband refuses to talk to me. Never did he acknowledge how the text would have made me feel. Instead, saying I was snooping, it was private. At this point, I know we were headed for divorce, and I feel drained and humiliated over his text. Um, did I go too far? He didn't get fired. Oh, I got a lot of thoughts on that one. Me too, but I'm going to let you begin. You want me to begin? Yes. <sighs> Regardless how, of how this lady felt about reading those very hurtful texts and how he was conversing over text messages with his work buddies, those were very clearly messages not meant for anyone else's eyes other than the ones on the text. And how does she find the messages again? Uh, he was asleep, and yeah. then she saw a notification, and she went through the phone. Yeah, yeah. But apparently, it was his work phone, because that's what her sister mentioned. That is, that is. Uh, look, whatever you want to say about her going through his phone, but the fact that he's having these private conversations, and then you escalated it to HR because you're feeling attacked because he identified problems in your marriage that maybe it's his fault, maybe it's your fault, but he is venting to his friends and getting the same consolation he gets from them that you get from your sister. Although he's doing it in a way where he's not escalating it up to HR the way that you did. Um, you're asking me if, if you're the asshole for doing that. Yeah. Not only are you the asshole, but you may have been guilty of several uh, civil causes of action. Um, breach of, look, you have, when you enter a marriage, you become fiduciaries with that person, meaning you have the utmost uh, duty of trust and care for that person. That extends to finances. It extends to your your personal communications. Um, there's even like a, a married folks privilege where you don't even have to be forced to testify yes. against your husband, provided you're still married mm -hmm. and all of that. And so she... Uh, gets butthurt over these text messages. I'm not saying that what he wrote in the messages was, you know, altogether tasteful, um, but it had nothing to do. Um, well, I'm not going to say it didn't have anything to do with her. He was doing it to his friends. It's no different than when anybody goes to their friends to play golf, to, um, I don't know, what do women do? Go to the bar, girls' night out, you know? Sex in the city, cocktails, cosmopolitans. I would like to have a sex on the beach with a maraschino cherry and a lemon. He was the one who quoted that, not me. Let's just point that out. That's Dominic's favorite drink. <laughs> uh, but it's, um, yeah, that, that is so beyond uh, what is appropriate in a relationship where you're supposed to have that level of trust with your partner. Let's just say it was you, Melissa. Okay, so you have this text message thread going between you and your girlfriends, and you're talking about how your husband is, I don't know, he's lazy and he doesn't get housework done or he can't cook for shit or some kind of thing about him in bed. And it's not meant for anybody, but it just is, you happen to be part of this thread, he finds it, and then, like, he sends me the messages. How would that make you feel, from one? And would you view it as a... As a um, 
the ultimate, well, maybe not the ultimate betrayal, but a betrayal in general? Not a betrayal, but I would be like, and this is what I pointed out. If my husband would do that to you, I would be like, why did you send that to him? Explain to me. The thing is, I feel she did that because he was having a conversation with his co-worker. So that's why I feel she did it. Maybe if it was other friends who had nothing to do with All right, job, let's just say that, that it was a message between you and, uh, let's say, like somebody that's worked here before. Um, and it's just between you two. And like maybe it was like our, uh, I don't know, our ring central communications. And then your husband sends it to me. Then what? How does that change the equation? No, I would be like, why did you do that? Like, First of all, if anybody sent me something like that, like, you know, it's from your husband, like, what the fuck are you sending me this for? What do you think I'm going to do about it? That's a personal issue between you two. You guys deal with it. And that would be the end of it because it doesn't really affect. But, you know, never mind. This is different. HR departments are. Yeah, I know. It's something like different. HOAs. It's a big co corporation is something completely different. Yeah, they got to do a lot of stuff. If you've ever been in a deposition with an HOA or with a um, HR department, it is so, uh, I don't know. They're just like walking around with sticks up their ass the whole time. They have no regard for anything that's human. Everything is like this corporate speak. It just, it's, it's the worst kind of deposition. But that's the kind of people that you've now escalated it to, and now they're involved in your personal life. You've fundamentally embarrassed uh, not just your husband, but I can't imagine she feels good walking around there being the subject of those messages. I mean, that's very private information that you just shared with the entire universe that you, uh, every single day you have to go to work and, and be there. So, look. I'm not saying that what she did was fine. It was not. I would have not gone that far. I would have just screenshotted everything, sent it over to my phone, confronted the person, and then if he denied it, then I would show the screenshots like. She could have just woke him up and just started talking to him about it right then and there. No, not waking up. Just wait till he wakes up on himself. I'm sure he would have preferred that as opposed to, hey, let's just make this an HR matter. No, no, no. What I mean is I would have, what she should have done, in my opinion, is wait for him to get up and then confront him about the situation, but not send this to the entire workplace of his workplace. Like, everybody's going to know her business now. And his business. And his every single person. If I was him, that might be grounds for divorce. That is like the ultimate, viol that is like almost worse. It's a violation of privacy. Then it's almost worse than being cheated on. It's one thing to be cheated on. I'm not saying that's, that it's worse than being cheated on. But if you're going to take. A private matter. Put it this way. Your husband knows everything about you. He knows what everybody else sees. And he knows what nobody sees. And he gets to see that in confidence. And you show him that side of you in confidence that he's not going to go show everybody else. He knows you at your absolute worst. He knows you, um, you know, the worst of your personality. He know he's seen you at, at the before you're all made up and ready to go out and see the world. He sees you as you're waking up and uh, he knows all of your medical concerns and conditions and all those things. And for him to go out and just broadcast all of that, your most intimate moments to everybody else, to people that were never, you never intended to know about that, that is almost as bad as somebody cheating on somebody, in my opinion. It is. And so, yeah, she honestly, if I were advising this guy, I would say, you know what? You might want to file for divorce on that one. There's several legal theories that I may pursue in terms of breaching fiduciary duties. It depends on how the damages would roll out. And I don't even want to get into that because it's too speculative. I'm just saying that, yeah, that's, that's a, that is grounds for divorce. Yeah. If you ask me, she's lucky. I mean, she already says they're already headed for divorce anyway. She but said they left. She said she left the house. Before. She did that because she wanted to hurt him in the, in the worst way possible. She's a malicious, conniving woman. And when you get a person like that on the other end of a divorce case, you're going to be in litigation for a couple of years. Forever. Mm -hmm. That is true. So let's move on with this one. From this one. We got one more. I'll make it quick. Can I make it quick? We'll see. Uh, nope. <laughs> we cannot make it quick. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway. All right. Oh, wait. I already did this one.
yeah, that was it. That was all we had. Okay. So with that, um, that's all we really have to say for Family Law After Dark. Melissa, do you have any closing thoughts for any of the individuals that we addressed on this morning's episode? In all three situations, except for the harassment one, I would say all two. Police people don't do things impulsively and under the influence of alcohol or whatever the hell you're putting in your system because I... Like Karen Reed? I think that's what happened here because she said, like, I was a little tipsy. So, mm. yeah. D- don't do that, please. You're, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Just think about it and then communicate your thoughts and feelings later, but do, do not do something like that. Well said, I guess. <laughs> Um, just a, a, a Melissa, no more quoting Sex in the City. I won't let you back on the segment. As the sirens go. I'm just going to say that he did it, not me. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have for you for Family Law After Dark. Thank you for listening to the entire podcast. If you have, if you joined us for a discussion on the Karen Weed case, um, we always love to have you for the Family Law After Dark segment. Um, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe uh, to the show. You're going to want to get um, in on what we have to say next about some of these other cases. We've got a lot of good ones coming up. We've got the Chad Daybell trial still going on. Karen Reed's about to be in trial for the next six to eight weeks. There's a lot of other cases that you guys have thrown at me that we're going to be covering. So uh, join the family. If you haven't done so already, we will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.